Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. It reads, it says, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went down toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones that, of that place and put it at his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Somebody say, that's a bad idea. If you're laying on a rock, how comfortable can that be? Well, pastor, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the rock. I'm sure he is, but he ain't comfortable to sleep on. That is not. Verse 12, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold. I am with you. Somebody say, God is with me. I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, I, I, everybody has their own opinion. It's just Stephen Taylor's opinion. I think this is the most scary phrase in all of scripture. Jacob said, surely the Lord is is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Surely the Lord was in this place, and I did not know it. I have a message entitled for you today, if I only knew. If I only knew, come on, tell somebody, if I only knew, come on, find one person, if I only only knew, Father God, all our desire, all our passion, all our desperation, all our hunger is to know you like we've never known you before. God, you're here. Speak, heal, deliver. Just continue where you've already started. And we'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say amen. amen and amen and amen. There are different moments where people you really like, whether it is an athlete, an actor, a famous business person or a politician or whatever it may be, there are moments when a microphone is put in their face. And they are asked a question. And you loved them before you heard them speak. (laughs) But after you heard what came out of their mouth, the thought just came through your mind, go back to singing. (laughs) This, you know, no, this isn't for you. You just build companies. You don't give wisdom. That's not your strength. It's not your advice. There, there, there's sometimes when I watch somebody interviewed or hear something that they say, and I'm just like, Ugh, it just grits on my nerve. One of the things that grits on my nerve is when they ask some famous singer, some famous actor, a, a business person, a politician or whatever in an interview, knowing what you know now, looking back at your younger self, what would you do differently? You ever heard, you ever heard them ask that question? Kind of like a biography, how'd you get to where you were? If, if you knew what you knew now, what, what would you do different? And the answer that just drives me up a wall is when the person said, I, I wouldn't change anything. Because <laughs> everything I've been through made me the man or made me the woman that I am today. It's the bumps and the bruises. I, 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 I wouldn't change a thing. And first of all, I'm like, you a lie. And second, if you're not lying, you're an idiot. (laughs) Because I can think of (laughs) 17,000 things I would do differently knowing what I know now (laughs) if I could go back and do it all over again. Is anybody in the same 
boat as me. If I had known what I know now, I'd have kept walking. I wouldn't have said hi to her. I would have just minded my dog on business. I'd have gone to work and made money. Come on, can anybody testify? If I had known what I know now, I wouldn't have taken that job. I would have skipped that class. Come on, I'd have paid more attention in school. Can can it? <laughs> I need deliverance right now. Okay, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Y'all, I got a 2.9 GPA, 2.97 GPA. First of all, greatest school on planet Earth, University of Maryland College Park. I was so mad because I was I was 0. 0.03 away from a 3.0. And you know what's why? First of all, I earned every bit of that 2.97. Apparently, you don't get a 3.0 when you major in basketball in the gym. <laughs> I didn't even know where the library was until senior year of college. Got my 2.9. I didn't care. I got my degree. It was whatever until I went in for my job interview. Got, got, got my job offer and got to the negotiation place. And I'm saying, well, listed on your website, it says that this is the starting salary. I I was hoping to make this. And that man looked me in my eye, straight face, and said, no, that salary applies to people with a 3.0 GPA or above. You, sir, (laughs) have a 2.97. He didn't say this, but your teacher didn't grave on the curve, and we ain't going to pay on the curve. And I sat there heartbroken. Like, if I had only known freshman year, if I had woken up and just gone, like, (laughs) if you're in college, please go to class. Listen, from the old guy who regrets those three years. I did graduate a year early, so, but good God almighty, if I had only... No. I think that's what Jacob was saying in Genesis 28. When he said, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Here's, here's, here's just my, my thought. You, you can read the verse and you, you can make your own conjecture. Here, I, I don't think that Jacob was saying that out of elation. I don't think Jacob was saying that, oh my gosh, God is here. I think Jacob was more saying, oh my gosh, God is here. And and I think when it hit Jacob that God was there, I I, I think, come on, you you ever ever kind of rewound a movie or scrubbed it if you're streaming it, but you could still see it as it's going? And the whole movie is like playing back. I think in this moment, Jacob just began to rewind his life. The moment when he lied to his father to steal his brother's inheritance. The moment when he tricked his brother into giving him his birthright because he did not trust God to do what God had already promised. I'm just wondering if in that moment Jacob was saying it out of regret of if I had known that God was with me the entire time, I wouldn't have had to lie, cheat, backstab, ruin relationships. I wouldn't have been who I was if I had just known that he was with me. What what, what are some things that we do? What are some mindsets that we have? What are some worldviews that we've adopted because we did not know that God was with us the entire time? Can you imagine that season of your life when you were outrageously stressed, overwhelmed, couldn't sleep at night because you had no idea how this situation was going to work out? Knowing what you know now, that God was with you in the moment, that he kept you, that he actually made it better on the other side, that he gave you back double for your trouble. I don't know about you, but I wish I got a little bit more sleep in that season. Come on now. Can anybody think back to that period of your life where you really wanted that person to like you? And you actually started to lose who God made you to be just to attract them and their affection. If you had only known in that moment, if you like me, you like me. If you don't like me, it don't mean nothing to me because I know who my God is. And if he be for me, it don't matter. 
If I had only known, come on, I ain't going to be honest enough to say I wouldn't have been so grimy. I, <laughs> I'd have looked out for somebody else. I, I would have helped. If I had known, them moving up would not have kept me from having. I wouldn't have been so selfish. I, I wouldn't have been so consumed in me. Can I, can, I, can I submit something to you? Your experience here on earth is based on how much you know of God's activity in your life. Your experience here on earth is not based on your emotional intelligence. It's not based on your ability to get people to like you. It's not based on your charisma. It's not based on your ability to make money. It's not based on your ability to make people do what you want them to do. Your experience here on earth is based on your knowledge of how much God is for Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. One translation says it's your reasonable act of worship. Here, here, here leave the verse up. Here's what Paul is saying. Yo, bruh, homie. Oh, we're in church. Brother and sister in Christ. Paul said he died for you so that you don't have to die for your own sin. The least you can do. Like, like this is, this is minimum. is to offer your life as an act of worship unto God. And it says, and do not be conformed to this world. What, what, what's this world? I got to be liked. I got to be intelligent. I got to be educated. I got to have more money than you. I got to be more successful than you. He said, get rid of that mindset, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul said the transformation of your thinking, the awareness of how much God is for you will dictate the level of your experience here on earth. If I could just talk for a second, what breaks my heart is people who have the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of them, but their experience is mediocre. It's average. It's victory. It is not the glory to glory to glory that Christ died on the cross for you to have. And hear me, it's not based on him not doing his job. It's based on us not being aware of all that he has done for us. Over these next four weeks, our goal is to increase our awareness. Of God, who are you in my life? Who am I? Who are, wh- what is this world that you have placed us in? What, what's that increase? It's just faith. I need more faith that God is who he says he is and that he's moving in my life the way that he says he's moving. How do I get that faith? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The verse so short, we could do it twice. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? So faith comes by and hearing by my grandma's opinion. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the hand life has dealt me. Come on now. So many of us have more faith and what daddy taught me, what grandma said is life, what somebody, instead of what the word of God says, my goal is that my faith, my awareness of what God is doing in my life is ever increasing. And the only way it's ever increasing is by hearing and hearing, hear me, the word of God. Help with your neighbor say, that's the only reason I come to church. That's the only reason I come to church. Come on, tell someone. Tell someone. Tell someone. Even if you lie into them, just tell them. Come on now. Sometimes, sometimes faith starts with a lie. You just got to say it till you believe it. <laughs> no, can, 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 can I help you? That's the only reason we're here, all. Two, two reasons we're here. We're here to worship God and experience God. And we're here for our faith to be built in God. 
I, I'm not here to tick something off on a goody two-shoe list. Some of you are. That ain't why I'm here. Why are you going to church? Well, you know, I'm always needing to have a home church, and that's what good Christians do, and I'm that. No, miss me with that. I'm, I'm here so that God can take my faith to the next level. Because when my faith goes to the next level, I see him in a whole new way. And when I see him in a whole new way, I experience life and his presence and his power and all that he is in a brand new way. Somebody say amen. amen. So I, I want to give you three things about God that we're going to talk about today that I really think Jacob, if he were here, would say, if I had only known, if I had only known this, I would have acted differently. I would have lived differently. I would have experienced differently. I would have walked in something. The first thing I think Jacob would say is if I had only known the love of God. Jacob said, if I had known the love of God, it would change everything. How do I keep the transformation, the change that God is beginning in my life to know how much he loves you? Paul to the church of Ephesus wrote this in Ephesians chapter three, verse 17. By the way, y'all, Paul said, this is my one prayer. If I only were allowed one prayer, if there's only one thing I could ask God, Paul said, this is what I would ask. I said, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that faith word. Here's what Paul said. He said, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Paul said, if I had one prayer to pray for the church, I would pray that you would be anchored in the love of God may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to just grasp one word, one translation to comprehend how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, he said, it's not an intellectual love that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is mind-blowing. Paul said your comprehension of how much God loves you will dictate how much God can fill you. Here, here's, here's the problem. The type of love that God has for us, none of us have ever experienced in our life. So some of us have experienced what I call performance love. Where I love you because you're doing what I need you to do. And I'm making it very clear to you, as long as you continue to do what I want you to do, you will get my time, you will get my attention, you will get my affection. The only problem is when you stop doing what I want you to do, I, some of us grew up in homes where family members would intentionally withdraw their love from us to teach us a lesson. You, you did not perform the way that I wanted you to perform, so I now will not speak to you for two days. And, and, and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to give you the cold shoulder because I'm trying to teach you, you either perform the way I want you to perform or you do not have access to me. And for some of us, we were trained in this type of love so much that we just assume I've got to perform if anybody's going to like me. Come on now feel like freedom conference, don't it? <laughs> some, some of us are used to transactional love. That I only going to love somebody that has something I want, that has something to offer me and move my life forward. And if you can lose, move my life forward and I can move your life forward, then we will be in love in that moment. But the second you don't have anything to offer me, I'm going to go find somebody else who can. One of the problems with marriages today are people are moving into marriage with transactional love. That's why the old folks, when they used to give their marriage vows, they used to say stuff like in sickness and in for richer or for, I was talking to somebody and say, pastor, when you, when you do my wedding, I don't want to say that. I said, what you mean? They said, I, I don't want to say in sickness and health. I, I don't want to say in richer or for poor. And I said, why? Because I'm not speaking sickness over my life. 
And I'm not speaking poverty over my life. I'm, I'm not decreeing that over my marriage. I said, well, you can decree <laughs> whatever you want to decree. <laughs> However, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. And if we want to get our theology correct, he ain't never said you'll never get sick. He just said by his stripes, you've already been healed. Come on now. We've got to get this mindset that, no, it's not transactional. Some of us, we're just used to erratic love. That it just depends on where the moon was last night. <laughs> depends on how much sleep you got, depends on how stressed you are, of how you're going to treat me, and I just kind of know that is what it is, so I'm going to take what I'm used to, and what we don't even realize, and there's doctors and scientists in the room, they'll tell you how life, a year after year after year after this, your brain waves actually get programmed to think this is what love is. And then we come in contact with Almighty God that says, I don't need you to perform for me to love you. The Almighty God that says, no offense, you ain't got nothing to offer me. <laughs> so it can't be transactional because I is who I is without you. <laughs> you can't breathe without me. <laughs> come on, how many people know that's a bad transaction? When you encounter this God, that his love is not erratic. He said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And some of us don't know what to do with God because we can't manipulate him. I can't perform for him and make him love me more. I can't offer him something that makes him love me more. And he is consistent. I don't know what to do with that. And some of us have this mindset, oh, God loves us because he has to. It's kind of it's kind of kind of like a mother loving her child. You know what I mean? You gave birth to that kid. You got to love it. Well, some of us know that's not true. <laughs> Come on now. And we're just like, uh, I don't I don't know what to do with God. I'm used to performing and I know what my performance was and my performance isn't up to his standard and there's no way he could still love me. Yeah. The only love I can understand is transactional love and I know enough to know I ain't got nothing to offer him. So, so we just kind of avoid him. And Paul said that my prayer is that you would step past intellect and get to the experiential place where you realize the love of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, it says this, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul said, let me tell you how much God loves you when you were not thinking about him. When you were living a life that caused him to go to the cross, he said, you're worth it, you're worth it, you're worth it, you're worth it, you're worth it. And here's what blows my mind when they came to Paul and they said, Paul, you've been shipwrecked, you've been beaten, you've been spat on, you've been abused by unbelievers and the believers. Why in the world do you keep on going through all of this? And Paul said, if you knew who I was, I was a murderer, I was the chief of sinner. And in the midst of my despicable state, he loved me and he actually thought I was worth something. If you could just comprehend when you were at your worst, it is when God loves you the most and said, hey, that's the person that I want. Could you imagine how confused the angels were when Jesus said, I'm leaving heaven and I'm going to go die for Stephen. Gabriel was like, the one from Baltimore? <laughs> you gonna die for a 2.97? <laughs> Some of y'all graduated <laughs> summa cum laude. <laughs> Got the little stupid cords around your neck. <laughs> I went to Joanne Fabric, bought me some cords, put that joint around, graduated. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Angel said, you gonna die for him? He 
said it's worth it. He said it's worth it. When you were lying, it was worth it. When you were cheating, it was worth it. When you were smiling in people's face and stabbing them in their back, it was worth it. You were confused about your gender and identity. It was worth it. He said, my prayer is that you would comprehend. And here's what Paul said. He said, when you experience the love of God, it so grips your heart that it changes who you are. I think Jacob is saying, man, if I had only known how much God loved me, I'd have done things differently. Second thing I think Jack would have said is, if I had only known the goodness of God. You gotta understand, the love of God and the goodness of God are two different things. God said, he told us in Corinthians 13 what love is. He said, my love towards you is that I'm patient, that I'm kind, that I'm keeping no record of your wrong, that I'm always committed to you, always thinking the best of you, always persevering, always trusting. He, he said, that, that's what my love, my, my goodness is that I'm trying to move you to a better place in life. So J Genesis 28, y'all, Jacob, Jacob's on the run, y'all. Jacob, you, you may not know this, but Jacob had just stolen tens of millions of dollars from his brother by tricking his father into if, if you had had time to unpack this you had abraham isaac and jacob we talk about solomon's wealth solomon's wealth it was cool whatever abraham was loaded y'all abraham would have been the equivalent of a billionaire in this land he left everything that he had to Isaac. And when Isaac was dying, he was supposed to give two thirds of all that he had to his oldest son Esau and one third to Jacob. Jacob came in and <laughs> forged the documents, faked his brother's signature and stole everything from his brother. When his brother found out, he said, hey, don't worry. I'm not gonna do anything to you until dad dies. But, but once dad dies, I'm going to kill you, man. <laughs> and Jacob's mother came to him and said, hey, your dad, he ain't looking too good, okay? He little purple. He about to go. You've got to run because Esau is already making his plans with his troops to come and take your head off of your shoulders. So pack your bags. You got to go. By the way, when you manipulate your way into something, when the funk hits the fan, you've got to leave it all behind to run anyway. So it makes no sense cheating for what you got because you won't be able to keep it in the first place. Can I just preach for a second? Esau ended up getting 100% of the inheritance because Jacob's manipulation removed him from the place of favor. Track it. So Jacob is running for his life. All homie got is a backpack and some buns that mama had made him before he left. And he stops in the place called Haran. Somebody say Haran has nothing to sleep on except a rock, lays down on a rock, a thief, a crook, a manipulator, someone that had ignored God for decades, and here comes God over that rock. Oh, Jacob. Boy, I got some plans for you. When I tell you, boy, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you so good it's going to blow your mind. This land that you ain't got nothing but a rock to lay on right now, when I'm done with you, it is all going to belong to you. Your children's children's children are going to be blessed. Matter of fact, Jacob, anybody who knows you is going to be blessed just by the fact that they know you. It is going to blow your mind. What am I going to do through? Yo, this was the worst moment of his life. This was possibly one of the most sinful moments of his life. 
And instead of God saying, how could you? What's wrong with you? You disgust me. Don't you know I was going to do this for you anyway? God came and said, Jacob, if you only knew how I'm working, hear me. Somebody needs to hear this. God is working on your comeback and you ain't even got right yet. You've got to understand you serve a God that is so good that while you weren't even thinking about him, he said, as soon as they get back to me, oh, I'm going to set them up. I'm going to move in their life in a great, we serve a good God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. The word prosper means to move forward. Some of us ain't got no plans except to make it to Monday. God said, don't worry, I got plans for you. They're plans that you ain't going to be where you are right now. I'm planning on moving you forward. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. If you've been at Union Church for any amount of time, you know this is my favorite verse in all of Scripture. This, this verse is actually what pushed me into the ministry. I remember reading this verse at 16, and it was just a Holy Spirit moment. Here's how I describe it. It's like the verse popped out of the Bible, smacked me in the face, and dropped right back down. <laughs> and said, he's talking about you. Because for some reason... I thought there wasn't much special about me. Maybe it was my 2.97. That was my evidence. <laughs> I was just like, you know, it's, it's just, it is what it is. And God said, no, no, no. I knew you before you were born in your mother's womb. Yeah. I've called you. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose for you. Don't, no matter what that teacher said about you. It doesn't matter what your mama said about you. It doesn't matter what your daddy said about you. No matter what your GPA says about you. It doesn't even matter if you don't have a college degree. I've got plans for you. And my plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But the thing about God's word is every time you read it, you'll see it on a deeper level. And if you keep reading it, you'll realize there's a depth to this thing that'll blow your mind. Do you know when God says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future that Israel was not even in their own home. They were slaves in Babylon with no soldiers, no army, no ability to get their own freedom. And it was in that moment, in their worst moment, in their disgusted moment, in that suicidal moment, in that depressed moment, in that divorce moment, in that heartbreak moment, in that moment where you're saying it can't get any worse than that. It's in that moment that God came to tell you, I know the plans that I have for you. Hear me. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I don't know who this is for, but the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that this is the worst your life will ever be. It is only up from here. Those haters that are laughing laughing at you, that are saying you got what you deserve. Tell them you better laugh now because this is the last opportunity you're going to have to see me where I am because my God is a good God and he's got great plans for me. I feel like Jacob was like, man, if I had only known that I don't have to make something of myself. If I had only known, it really don't matter what happened to my granddad, what happened to my dad, that stops here. Not because I'm going to muscle my way out of it, but because the creator of the universe knows me and has a plan for my life. I'm just telling you, if I could impart confidence, swag, just a little bit of Holy Ghost arrogance on you, if you just knew the call of God on your life, if you just knew that he called you before you were formed in your mother's womb, and if you don't trust me, ask Jonah. He knew about the detour. He knew about the season that you were not going to follow him, and he set his plan up for you just perfectly, that when you came to your right mind, it'd be the right moment for what he had in store for you. He's a good God. Anytime I feel the pressure of life to perform, anytime I'm tempted to manipulate my way forward, anytime I look at my life and I feel like I should be further than I am right now, I have forgotten how good God. The problem with receiving God's love is we've been adulterated by all these toxic loves. The problem with understanding the goodness of God is we're used to being orphans. 
And even if you have biological parents that you know, there's still an orphan spirit that comes on all of us as a result of sin. When we have this ideology that it's me against the world, that I'm all I can rely on. And God help you if you try to rely on some family members or some friends or some spouses and they weren't there for you when you needed them. It just reinforced this toxic mindset that it's you against the world. And God said, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to break this orphan spirit off of your life. Do you know the word adoption is mentioned after the resurrection of Christ seven different times in the New Testament? He keeps on saying it over and over and over again. He's trying to let you know you are not on your own anymore. You've got blood. You've got kin. You've got family. You've got a father. Romans 8, 14, for as many are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. Hey, hey ladies, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciate you just for a second. Somebody shout, I'm a son of God. Come on, say it real bold. I'm explaining in a second. Somebody say, I'm a son of God. Can I tell you why he said sons of God and not sons and daughters? I know where I'm preaching. I'm preaching in 2024. Every time the Bible says something masculine, we're like, what? No, sons and daughters. <laughs> Can I help you out? When he means sons and daughters, he'll say it. Because in Genesis 1:27, when he said, let us make man in our own image, he said, let us make them male and female. He'll, he'll split the genders when he wants to split the genders. But there's sometimes he's talking about genders. And then there's sometimes he's talking about inheritance. And when he says these are the sons of God, he ain't talking about a gender. He's talking about an inheritance. And he said, trust me, you want to get paid like you're the firstborn son. That's what he's saying right there. He's saying, you've got the position as if you're my firstborn. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Don't let that spirit come on you. Man, now I'm a Christian. I got to perform for God. I, I got to make God happy with me and I can't mess up. And, and I've got, he said, don't let that religious spirit get on you. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. God said, I need that spirit of adoption to come on. If, you, if you, you've ever seen any of the presidents of the United States, when they had, not many of them, but some of them had young children when they were president, you always see a picture of that young child just sitting up in the Oval Office <laughs> at the desk that nobody would dare sit on. It's, that Oval Office desk is the closest thing America has to a throne. Every senator, Congress, president, everybody know, don't sit there. Vice president, don't touch it. But something about them little kids. <laughs> I don't care how many secret services you, you can't tell me what to do. Because <laughs> my daddy, <laughs> that's the same spirit that God is trying to get on you where you actually really, listen, that may apply to you because you don't know who your daddy is, but I know who my daddy is. And because I know who my daddy is, I've got access to whatever my dad says I've got access to. Last thing is this, I believe Jacob would have said, man, if I had only known the Lordship of God. Boy, God loves me. Somebody say, God loves me. Somebody say, God is good to me. But he ain't your little friend. <laughs> your mama ever tell you that? Come on, you, you, ever, you, got a little, you ever got a little too comfortable with your mama? <laughs> you, ever, you, ever, you, ever, you ever responded just a little too quickly to your dad? <laughs> and he said, whoa. And now we wrestling and playing around, but let me remind you, I ain't your little friend. Why did I gotta say little friend? My friend is six foot two. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to explain something to you. I'm trying to, we ain't on the same level. <laughs> you you little, little, little Jesus, my homeboy, you can wear that t-shirt all you want. Little, what would Jesus do? He ain't, he ain't your little friend. <laughs> I think Jacob in hindsight would say, I know where I got in trouble. I got in trouble when I heard God's prophecy over my life, but I tried to fulfill it in my own strength. You see, before Jacob was born, God prophesied 
over his mother's womb and said the younger is going to serve the older. Best believe his mama told him that as soon as he could understand English. Because the Bible says all throughout his life, his mother was putting pressure on him saying, hey, go do this for your dad. Make sure your dad like She was trying, and that, that's what we do. We hear something great from God, and we try to make it out. We try to work it out in our own strength. So God says, I'll give you the ability to make wealth. And we say, amen. And then we try to do it without him. Come, come on now. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to bring a suitable help mate. Oh God, I'm Bill Graham. And we go try to do it on our own. I think, I think what, what, what Jacob was saying is, man, if I had only known just because God had a great future for me, it doesn't mean that I had to do it in my own strength. But my job was actually to seek the one who had the plan in the first place. I got, I got a pastor friend. He lives in New Orleans, born and raised. And uh, I, don't, I don't know where you like to eat in, in America. New Orleans is that spot, y'all. Like, you ain't, you ain't never eaten until you go to New Orleans. But, but what he told me going down there is any restaurant that you can Google ain't good. <laughs> he said, them New Orleans places with 4,000 reviews on Yelp. He said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, that, that ain't real Creole. He said, that ain't real Cajun food. He said, that, that ain't. He said, he said let, me, let me take you to the spots. So I went down and preached at his church and he took me out on Monday for some food. Y'all, when I tell you, for, pardon my French, the hell holes, <laughs> I'm telling you, one restaurant was like in somebody's grandma's backyard. <laughs> one spot looked like it should have been condemned by the food administration. And I mean, they bring you out silverware. What's that? Who needs a plate? I'm talking about just a, a plastic basket with a little, but them boudin balls. When I tell you, they bring out that, that, that fried alligator leg, talk about it tastes just like chicken. Well, I'll have chicken. I'm good. <laughs> what kind of foolishness would it be me never being to New Orleans, telling a native where I want to eat? No, he's the one who's been there. He's the one that's experienced it all. If I want to have the great experience, I just need to God says, I am the one who was and is and is to come. And when I come to speak to you, I'm not coming from your past. I'm coming from your future. I'm coming from your children already graduating college. And you just got the information that the doctor said you can't have kids. I'm coming from you being debt free. And you just realized you're going to file for bankruptcy. I'm coming from your future telling you, hey, I've been there already. And just trust me, it looks a lot better than you think it does. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on the verse says on your own understanding can I say it this way on your limited understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your that's not enough don't be wise in your own eyes but have respect for the fact that God been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. And he's just trying to tell you the best way to navigate it. And if he tells you it's evil, run from it. I'm not trying to keep something from you. I'm trying to get something to you. Jacob was here, he said, man, I wish I had known how much God loved me. I wish I had known how good he is to me. I wish I had known that, that my life works best. I've got seven, five, and three-year-olds, so we do this all the time. When he's the line leader. When it's just my job to follow him. And as I'm praying and reading my Bible, I'm in church, I'm saying, God, I want to experience your love afresh. God, show me the good thing that you're doing in my life. God, show me the next step, the next decision, the next response. Lead me, and I'll follow. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. Oh, that she, literally too good to be true is the thought that comes to mind. 
And God, I know I am regressing into performance love when I have the thought, what did I do to deserve this type of love? The fact is you don't love us because we deserve it. You love us because you're a good God. And God, I pray in this moment for every single person in the sound of my voice, God, I'm praying for a supernatural encounter right now that we'd be able to comprehend how wide, how high, the length and the depth of your love for us. Just when you're sitting with your eyes closed, your head bowed, can you pray this prayer with me? Say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And just give God a moment to make this time and make this message personal to you. I know for a fact there's some of you that you had no idea who God was up to this moment. You thought he was some evil overbearing judge just waiting for you to mess up. Not realizing he's a loving father that died for you and has great plans for your life. And now's your moment to make him your Lord. What that means is now's your moment to say, God, I need you. And all that I am, I'm given to you. So wherever you find yourself, if you're watching online, if you're in the room, if you're in one of our locations, you realize you've been coming to church maybe but never given God lordship control of your life. This is your moment. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I can't believe how good you are, but I'm grateful. I believe that you died on the cross, that you shed your blood so that all my sin, all of my mistakes can be erased. And in this moment, I give you all of me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on. Can you celebrate for every single person?